my name is Erica Dale. I am a senior account manager with NewComp, um, but we're very, very pleased and very excited to have Barb from Win University of Windsor to share her story of how they use um, IBM planning analytics to help them do enrollment and tuition projection. Just a quick aside, I, uh, I looked up, this is our second HEAC, or Higher Education Analytics Community event this year, but we've been going since 2014, so it's a uh, it's very long group. Your presenters today, myself, Erica, Carrie Moreno from IBM, will help set the stage, and the real star of the show, no pressure, Barb, I'm really just teasing, Barb Rayburn from uh, University of Windsor. A little bit about the community. We started it, like I said, in 2014. It's a consortium of three higher education uh, institutions, including Conestoga College. Uh, to make it more balanced between university and college, we want to address everybody, IBM and Newcomb. And our goal really is to inform, educate, and inspire you with stories of what other people are doing, new technologies that might come up on the into the avenue, and understanding what other people are doing from a best practice point of view, what's working, what's not working, because many of you have similar challenges, even though you're sort of in competition with one another. We wanted you to be able to have a safe forum in which you can share your thoughts and ideas. A little bit about Newcomp, your host today. We are an analytics firm located out of Toronto, but with a Calgary office as well. We serve coast to coast North America, continental, as well as the Caribbean. I did not get that territory, unfortunately. I got St. John's, Newfoundland, and Winnipeg, so I'm not sure who I need to talk to about that. Uh, we are multi-vendor partners, so yes, we grew up with IBM and we still love our IBM products, but we also work with other products. So if you have any questions about your data analytics, data warehousing, data lakes, governance, security, all of that stuff, please don't hesitate to reach out. A little bit about the services we provide. We help institutions like the University of Windsor to do things like what they're doing today, which is the financial planning and anal analytics from an institutional research, research point of view and an enrollment point of view. But we also help organizations with their BI and data visual visualization, the data governance and security and metadata management that goes on underneath it, and more into things like AI and machine learning. So how can we better predict the type of students that are going to come in or what students are going to come in? How can we better predict whether or not someone in 101 is likely to take 201, that type of thing? And of course, that includes all of our friends in the open source space. A little bit about these services, we provide high level advisory services, things like roadmaps, best practices, uh, what else do we do? Health checks on existing environments, recommendations for room for improve, improvement, pure hands-on keyboard development, think of it like staff, staff AUG if you want, training and mentoring on specific products and managed analytics. So maybe you don't want to have something on-prem, you're not sure which cloud vendor you wanna go with, we can help you with that as well. And of course, licensing with most of the major uh, major vendors in this space. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit of a braggart when it comes to the IBM licensing. I've been around a very long time and know it better than a lot of the IBM people themselves, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, so you guys can throw rocks at me later if you want. So I think with this, what we're gonna do is, is pass this over to uh, Carrie to, to take it from here. Okay, go ahead, Carrie. It's over to you. Thank you, Erica. And I uh, remembered to take myself off mute right away, so hope everyone can hear me. And uh, first off, thank you everyone for joining us. I know um, in these times of the pandemic, many of us are spending hours and hours on our systems, and uh, we truly appreciate your time and investing with us just to hear a little bit about IBM planning analytics and um, the journey that the University of Windsor is has and is on. So just before I, I, I dive into a few slides, I just wanted to share um, a little bit about a recent McKinsey study that was published in April of this year. And in that study, it shared that higher education institutions face fierce headwinds today. Many institutions are contending with declining enrollment and budget shortfalls even before the pandemic. And uh, we know that these challenges have been heightened as a result of the pandemic. And for those of us that are working in higher ed, we understand the challenges. And the, the reason why we understand those challenges is because we experience, we experience those every day. Um, we continue to look for ways to support our institutions with the data that they need to make informed decisions. 
and we know um, often when we're asked for data or numbers, um, some people think that there's a magic wand that that can be produced very easily. But for those of you that are in the trenches, if I can call it that, know that uh, often there's a lot of work that goes into producing that data or um, creating those reports. So um, from an IBM perspective and, and many vendors, and, and it's as published in, in Educause, which is an organization um, that many of you are probably familiar that works within the industry supporting academia across uh, the world, we are seeing that academic institutions are making new investments and commitments in using their data to inform their strategic decisions. Um, and those decisions uh, are to support student success. And I know in the province of Ontario, we've specifically seen recent announcements um, about key performance indicators and how funding that is coming to the institution is dependent on the performance of those key performance indicators. So there's a big focus on using the data that we have and leveraging it um, you know, for, for the greater good of, of the university or, or the college. So today I'd like to just provide you with a very brief introduction to IBM Planning Analytics. Um, if you've heard of Planning Analytics, or if you haven't, you may have heard of TM1, that was the product name before. And then um, as Erica alluded to, you'll get to hear from Barb um, from the University of Windsor about what they're doing with Planning Analytics. So, what is planning analytics? Um, planning analytics is uh, an integrated planning solution uh, that automates planning, forecasting, and budgeting. It's designed to help accelerate processes um, and, and get access to more reliable results. Um, it powers the workflows on campus um, and it can help get greater accuracy and efficiency. And I think based on uh, some of the initial work uh, that we've done um, across some of our clients and what you'll hear from Barb, um, customer testimonials are that uh, planning analytics have helped them achieve that. So um, one of, one of the um, you know, kind of key outcomes of planning analytics is be, having the ability to be agile and easily adjust the plans and the forecasts in real time. And, um, based on our environments, um, we know that there's often opportunities where people will come forward and look for that data and they want it in real time to say, you know, what would it look like if we did this or what would happen if this happened? And um, using a planning analytics tool um, that provides for some of that um, is, is definitely um, a benefit. Now, there's, there's work and effort required to build these models and to build these capabilities. And that's what takes some time and some heavy lifting. Um, but once uh, that is done, um, the benefits are there. Another piece is around collaboration. So many of us know from an academic institution, there are many different groups on campus that have data, um, that leverage data in different ways, own the data, um, may be willing to share the data, may not be willing to share the data. So having a planning analytics tool really does bring together across uh, campus um, the different groups that have uh, responsibility for the various pieces of data that are important um, when looking at, at doing um, strategic planning. Also around acceleration. So we know that time is precious and we know that many of us do uh, lots of things and that anything that we can do um, to uh, work faster and work smarter is definitely something that we all uh, look to st uh, strive for. And if we can accelerate um, cycles and get real time information faster, it's definitely beneficial. So um, planning analytics is a powerful out of the box capability and it's got built in reporting, but you know, we all know nothing is really powerful quote out of the box. There's, there's definitely people in process that needs to be put in um, and support across the academic institution in order to take advantage of any type of new tool um, or uh, benefits that are, are going to come from it. So this slide just kind of highlights some of the capabilities that are in uh, planning analytics and um, you know, the way that uh, an academic institution could leverage it 
um, for the decision making that they have on campus. And you know, many things uh, that you see in kind of state of the art software solutions like easy to use web-based experiences, uh, visual analysis, uh, powerful modeling, uh, it has to be secured and it has to be governed and it has to be compliant with anything that's looking at, at data for sure. Uh, flexible deployment options. So um, as organizations are looking at their strategy for how they consume software, you know, whether it sits on premise or whether it's consumed as software as a service, uh, IBM's planning analytics is, is available um, in, in different models. So some of these pain points, and I'm not gonna read through these pain points because I think many of you probably go home at the end of the day and, and talk about these pain points either you know, amongst your colleagues or, or even amongst your peers that may work across the industry um, in supporting data. So um, one of the highlights of this solution is, is really an integrating planning capability. And we would be happy if there's interest in going deeper in the product um, we could definitely um, do a, uh, you know, kind of a deeper dive on the pieces and parts and functionalities of planning analytics, but we didn't want to do that today. We wanted you to hear, um, you know, from someone that, that is using it. So just a couple of examples, and I know within the higher education community, we always like to hear about what others are doing. And so I thought I would bring in a few examples um, because we're a global company, we've got opportunity to learn about what others are doing in other parts of the world. And so I've pulled a, a few examples um, of, of institutions that have embarked on a planning analytics journey. And, and what you'll see in uh, several of these um, testimonials is it's not something that happened overnight. It's a journey and it's an um, you know, initiative that has to be embraced on campus and uh, through the collaboration um, across campus, these academic institutions are actually now able to talk about the realized benefits. So the first one is Edith Cowan University. They're a university in Australia and um, their business challenge was to deliver timely, accurate and fit for purpose information across the university. And um, one of their, their key drivers were, uh, in terms of the benefit was uh, their focus on student enrollments and in, uh, understanding what those enrollment patterns would look like. Um, so that's very similar to what you'll hear Barb talk about. And the university uh, in the top right there talks about their outcomes where they were able to reduce the time for running complex queries on student data by about 150%. Um, from up to 12 hours to mere minutes. Um, and I think just on that very fact alone, there, there, there could be some smiles on faces if, if we were able to help uh, give back some of that time for you know, some of these more complex things. Um, it enabled searches to be done in real time, producing consistent results across faculties and organizations. And then there was a, a seamless integration between the various uh, uh, models. I jump to the next uh, slide. This is an academic institution. It's not a, a college or a university, but they're in Switzerland. And um, they were focused on giving students the best possible experience um, while they were studying abroad. And um, they were able to use IBM planning analytics to uh, get better control uh, over an insight into their finances and helping this organization get a greater path to profitability. And um, you can see over in the right-hand side there, um, you know, some of the outcomes that they felt um, and a quote um, from their head of, of business engineering. The next one is uh, London South Bank and they are in England. And uh, their business challenge was how could they gain the insight uh, that the university needed to optimize resource planning um, and making long-term prudent uh, investments. So with planning analytics, they were able to uh, gain a faster monthly payroll processing. They were able to load their annual budget into accounting systems faster. And they found that it boosted flexibility, uh, enabling any time, anywhere access to planning data. So just a couple of quick examples from across the globe, so to speak, and um, 
always interested to see how um, you know organizations and, and academia are leveraging tools to help them with a, a very complex um, you know need uh, around forecasting and planning. So I will turn it over to Barb. Okay, um, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. And um, okay, good. Um, I'm, I just introduced myself. I'm an institutional analyst and uh, at the University of Windsor and our office provides enrollment and tuition revenue projections used for the university budget. And I'm the person that runs the, the enrollment model. So today I'll be talking about our projection model. And so some of the topics that I'll cover, um, I'll take a look at the, an overview of the enrollment and tuition projections here at the university. And then um, we'll take a look at how our model was developed from when we started with um, planning analytics in, um, in 2016 and uh, right up to today in our current state of the model. And then I'll give you a tour of the model through some screenshots, some of the, the cubes that are involved. And we'll take a look at some screenshots in IBM Planning Analytics. And I'll talk about some of the lessons we learned um, and some of the benefits that we reaped from this. So to take a look so that you have an idea of what type of enrollment we're trying to project, this is our university um, historical full-time fall enrollment, just to give you an idea. And it includes um, our fall 2021 budget. And so our university, um, including part-time students, this is just a full-time, but including part-time students, we have just under 17,000 students. And uh, about 24% of our students are international. Yeah, with majority of those being at the graduate level. We have 190 undergraduate programs and 65 graduate programs. So our enrollment and tuition revenue projections, where we started in 2016, we were using an Excel model that had been in use for over 15 years. Um, it was a large Excel file um, to start with. And it evolved over that time. It did um, lack um, the ability to project by faculty. What it did very well is project enrollment at the institutional level, and those projections were reliable. But we started uh, seeing the need for enrollment projections by faculty since the university budget moved to an enrollment-centered model, which was a hybrid-style activity-based budget model um, where faculties were funded by enrollment-driven tuition revenue. So we definitely needed projections by faculty. And um, this model, this Excel model, could also not accommodate changes to the tuition framework as um, governed by the uh, Ontario government. And um, it could not... Uh, account for or accommodate changes to the government grant. So it became very labor intensive because each of these um, uh, changes necessitated separate Excel files to make manual ad hoc adjustments. So we were looking at one main file and then a number of other Excel files to uh, make it make the adjustments that were necessary. So in the end, we needed a, a model, that, um, we needed to find a different way to do these projections and a different model, uh, a different platform on which the model could be built because the model no longer worked for us. That was the bottom line. So um, we took a look at our options and um, in the group looking at the different options, IT services um, connected us to IBM, and we saw the capabilities of TM1. So in the end, the decision was made to purchase IBM Cognos Express on-premise, and that included uh, TM1 version 10.2. So that was our starting point. We had one production server, one development server, and 10 user licenses in this, um, in this model. And we saw that this would be a cost-effective way to use the enrollment projection model as a pilot to learn more about the capabilities of Cognos TM1. 
because we had no experience with um, cubes or Cognos or anything of that nature. We did not have a data warehouse on campus. So we were very excited about uh, developing some capabilities uh, using Cognos TM1. So the current just, model over... Sorry, okay, Barb, just for, uh, Yeah, just for those of you who have not been following the history of IBM Marketing's uh, point of view, TM1 is also named for IBM Planning Analytics. They got rebranded after you know, Barb and her team implemented it. So she's giving the true historical view of the product uh, and project. Sorry to interrupt you, Barb. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. Um, now, okay, so the current uh, the current model is um, a series of cubes. It's a series of eight cubes that we have in IBM Planning Analytics 2.0. Now, the IBM Planning Analytics software was upgraded in 2019. Um, our historical data is loaded into projection cubes. Our historical um, uh, tuition fees, and we just use one year of history to produce, uh, project um, future tuition fees. So our historical uh, tuition fees or our current year tuition fees are loaded. And then um, to project enrollment, we use historical enrollment patterns um, to project future terms. So uh, the calculations are simple, but they are complex. Now, um, it, it, within the cubes, we use real-time cube rules to um, perform the calculations. And this um, TAM1 allows the capability to write to the cube, and it produces results in real time. Once I refresh, um, I can see uh, the effect of my changes. And the, we do have the flexibility in each of the cubes to make adjustments along the way. So if we have information that comes from our faculties, information from our deans, information from enrollment management, we can incorporate that into the model. So this is another uh, uh, closer look to the, the way um, things work with starting with our source data. Our student information system is UInsight Student. Um, that's what we call it. It's uh, built on Campus Solution, an Oracle PeopleSoft product. And this was since we were part, we were progressing through our ERP journey from probably around 2016 onward. Um, this was part of it. So um, our model. Our enrollment model had to be rebuilt because of uh, the different data structures in UNSight student. So we were talking about processes, uh, uh, progress over five years, but we this was one of the speed bumps. We had to um, adjust to the new uh, student information system. So our historical enrollment is tied into our university statistical enrollment reporting um, that we do every term. Um, our enrollment is, um, so we look at ter uh, enrollment in each term, and then um, our, we pull our actual tuition rates also from new Insight student. And all this data is aggregated and extracted via SQL and it is exported to CSV. Now we left this additional step, this additional step of um, export via um, CSV, into planning analytics is done in the first step in planning analytics. The uh, planning analytics has an ETL tool. Um, it has processes that can handle the import of data directly. But we left this additional step because of the new student information system. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we use cube rules uh, to do the projections, and uh, we combine the head count that's calculated with the tuition rates, and then the tuition revenue is calculated um, using cube rules. We also have um, FTEs and WGUs, which are the weighted grant units uh, that are calculated for government grant. So once everything is calculated, our reporting is done through um, 
one cube, we combine all our projections from um, the seven, well, really six cubes into one cube for ease of reporting. Here we have our historical um, tuition revenue with, um, and we can split it out using the same, um, same dimensions as we uh, split out our projections or report on them. Um, my main go-to are still the legacy cube views. We do have some Excel reports. We do use um, the legacy Excel add-in of perspectives to um, connect uh, to the cubes and to view the data and to produce reports. Now we will be will, we will be upgrading this, but this is reality at this point. Um, and um, we have a file, we have a, a file that we produce that we send over to our budgets office. The software that they use is Oracle PBCS. And we create a file that is ready for import to Oracle PBCS. So they have a very simple import of all the data that we have um, that pertains to tuition revenue. And then uh, separately, our FTEs and WGUs, we have another analyst in our office that uh, as soon as I am ready with um, the, the final projection scenario for our budget, um, the analysts can go in and take a look at whatever views of the FTEs and the grant units that he needs to, um, um, that he uses for the grant for grant purposes for the grant calculations for the following year or for future years. Now to take a look at um, how the, the structure of the undergraduate enrollment cubes, there are three cubes. And the one that I'm showing on the left um, projects the overall enrollment and this is very very similar to the enrollment model in excel now this is this was our comfort zone we know that this projects really well for the university overall we wanted to have this cube in place what we needed it was the cube on the right hand side which produ um, projects enrollment by faculty now for each in, each, in this cube, we have um, a scenario that's defined and the scenario is defined um, using a scenario of using attributes so that dimension is defined using attributes and in there we can specify what what the first term projected is what the first last term projected is we can project out as far as we define the scenario so if we needed three years for a multi-year university budget we can do that uh, i can create a different scenario for our strategic mandate agreement that requires five years or maybe even seven years out i can go out as far as i am comfortable doing calculations um, so that's the scenario. So each cube has that. Uh, we also break it down by full-time, part-time. We project enrollment in each term. Uh, we project by academic career. Now this is something that is very similar to you Insight student. We have an undergraduate career, a graduate career, and an education career for teacher education. The year levels here are just like year one, year two, year three. Canadian visa would be your international domestic. And then here, these are the key pieces. We have faculty, and this is all internally allocated uh, programs in each faculty. So it is very custom to University of Windsor. And then we have the tuition is actually calculated in this group. So the measures in this case, the data that we're storing are head count. We have assessment level. We have the number of courses taken because um, for part-time students, uh, tuition is assessed by course. And then we have the capability in each cube, um, as you can see here, that we can have the capability to add adjustments at each point. Now to take a look um, at, this is just through the cube viewer, the legacy cube viewer through perspectives or through architect. And often I am working, since I'm very concerned about the numbers, 
and the reporting is um, comes at the very end. If my numbers are correct, there are, since this software works very well with Excel, there are many different ways. We have some reports, we can pull off data that's pivot ready, and it's very easy to uh, produce reports. So in this case, all I wanted to show you with this slide is our year one, um, our year one numbers are input, and so that's an assumption. And here I am inputting them at the lowest level. So these are the white cells. All adjustments have to be put in at the lowest level. So we had to think carefully about how many dimensions we had, because the more dimensions you have, the more um, adjustments you'll be putting in. Because in this case, I'd have to put in a, a, a number for Canadian students and for our international students separately. The reason the numbers are blue is because I have an option of a sandbox. If I'm working in a sandbox, I put in a value of 90. I refresh and all the values where my adjustment affected the cell, all the consolidations, all the roll-ups are shown in blue. So I can see what effect immediately what effect my um, uh, my change is, is making. And the sandbox is showing up here. Once I'm satisfied, I can go ahead and save that sandbox. So that, that's just um, something that I really, really like about the software. Um, we also, uh, in, uh, we also enter our intakes to our law, our second entry programs, our law and our teacher education separately. Those uh, have different enrollment patterns. Um, and uh, we get that information from other sources, from the deans or from enrollment management. And so this is a quick look at the faculty. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one, but uh, we have in the, in the background, we can see a detail screen by different tuition groups. Now these are different groups of students. Our business students pay different tuition than our computer science students. So those are the groups that you see. So these are just different views that are very, very easy to, they're very, they're um, just like a pivot table. We can um, uh, create column and um, row labels using our dimensions there. And this is the bottom portion well, it just shows us um, a roll up. I've blocked out the tuition here, um, just shaded it for privacy reasons. Um, but there are, we have the headcount, tuition, and everything is broken out by faculty. And I can compare right here, I'm comparing fall of 2020 to, I was projecting out to fall 2023, and I can compare as many fall terms or I can compare rolled up full year terms as well. So I can get the tuition for the whole, um, the whole um, okay. Hang on one second, you've got to bear with me because I made one critical error here. I did not plug in my laptop. Oh no, I hate when that happens. I had that on my to-do list before I started <laughs> and I, Missed out. I, I'm sorry. I apologize. Oh, Everything. No, don't worry about it. Maybe while you're doing that, we can just see if there's any questions from the group. Please feel free to unmute yourself and and let us know if there's questions so far. Barb's shown us an awful lot of functionality and used some some good terminology that you may not be familiar with. So please feel free to either ask them by unmuting yourself or in the in the chat, and I can um, I can moderate for you. I will ask for you. So just let us know when you're ready. Oh, there is one in the questions. Can I ask you a question, Barb? Are you still there? Sure, sure. Perfect. Yeah. Some institutions calculate tuition based on registrations, not on headcount. Do you use the full-time, part-time to estimate this? That's a great question. Um, we, uh, we calculate tuition based on headcount for um, and tuition that's paid by term for full-time students, for undergraduate students in general. And we use, um, for part-time students, it's paid by course. So that is all in our, um, all, that, all those structures are in our tuition projection cube, which I will show you as well. 
Um, yeah, so does that answer your question, I hope? I'm sure it does. And then just to add from a technology point of view, there's no reason you can't do it full time to part time as well. So the tool is very, very configurable where we can you take your business rules, basically anything that can be calculated as a formula or expressed as a formula can be done. So it's really just customized to the way you want to do your planning. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, so and we do calculate tuition for part-time students as well. It's not, uh, I'm not showing it, but we do calculate that. Right now, I'm, I'm just showing full-time, but um, we do calculate all of that. We have put all our calculations in anything that we wanted to do. Um, it was possible within the software. We didn't find any major roadblocks there at all. Right. Uh, Lena, thanks for putting your question in uh, the chat. That makes it a little easier for us. So um, we would like to know another question is, are FTEs and WGUs projected along with headcount? Yes, they are. We, um, I will uh, take a look. I'll take a look at that cube. It's done in a separate cube um, because our revenue is based on headcount. So I will um, I will skip over to I think that's the next slide I believe. Hang on, I'll take a look at the next slide. Yeah, and that's usually are, how, uh, how this how Lenoir runs. Is it's a, he usually is just one step ahead of the game. <laughs> Thank you for your question. So this is um, another cube that once the uh, head count is sorted out by faculty and the tuition revenue is projected the we take that the rules from this cube take information from the by faculty cube the head count and then we use we use ratios and we use our historical data to pro project FTEs in this case and um, we also project WGUs there's calculations in there for WGUs yeah, they're blocked out here because we don't normally make that public at this level of detail, but we do have WGUs and we can, um, right now, like the view I'm selecting is obviously eligible because I wanted to see the, those are students that are eligible for the grant. So that's where WGUs have a meaning. And in this case, I'm just looking at undergrad students. I can split it out. If I wanted to drag one of these dimensions over to the left-hand side, I can get further detail. And I can also uh, filter in any of the dimensions as, um, as I've done here for, uh, for eligible. And in this case, I can, uh, since our measures include um, actuals for 2021 and projections, I can have them side by side, uh, exactly split out in all the dimensions that I need. So I hope that answers your question and that's done in a separate cube. So there are three cubes that handle the undergraduate projections and hand, handle the working scenarios in the undergraduate projections. Next, we'll move on to the graduate enrollment cube. Now this is just one cube for graduate enrollment. Uh, graduate um, enrollment, grad programs um, have different enrollment pro uh, patterns than our undergrad. And then we have two types of um, graduate programs. We have cohort-based master's programs, which are generally four to six terms. And they're usually students move uh, through each term. There's no research component generally to those programs. And then we have um, research-based programs. So you'll see that we have a dimension here for grad academic program. And so this cube is basically almost broken down by graduate programs. Some programs are grouped together, like PhDs, uh, programs, and students move through a PhD in a very similar way in different faculties. The projections are still done by faculty. So students in science PhDs may move quicker than um, perhaps in our psychology PhD. And so that is taken into account here, that type of enrollment pattern. And we also, the other measure that we use here that is, uh, or sorry, the other uh, dimension that we use that's important for graduate programs is we track graduate by their semester of enrollment. So right here, you'll see that 
as um, for the input, for the assumptions here, I am entering um, assumptions for semester one. So that's our intake in our graduate program. So in this case, I've narrowed it down. If you can see the screenshot, I've narrowed it down for our master's in management program. And most of our graduate students are full-time, so I'm showing you full-time here. Um, and then I'm adding 90 normally in spring 2021. We have no students, but this was the pandemic year. We were taking, uh, because of the pandemic year last year, there were, was demand for this year. So, sorry. Um, and then, so we are projecting 90 students to come in. And all of these numbers are fictional numbers that I've created for in particular for this scenario, I've created a specific scenario just for this presentation. So I'm putting in 90 students to start in the spring of 2021. And so that's their first term. And then I'm not showing it here, but it will be tracking them in fall. They'll be in their second term. And then in winter, they'll be in their third term. Um, so that's how we track our grad enrollment. And grad students are generally enrolled uh, in every term. There are a couple so questions I'm, here, Barb, if you yeah. don't mind. So one question is, does the system maintain your previous entries and apply to the retention rates and apply retention rates to the role the head counts over? So I know that we can retain the previous entries, if nothing else, by the log file, but I'm curious what your specific model does. Um, okay, I'll try to, that's a good question. I'll try to answer it. Um, the way, um oh the, do we have retain our previous sorry i have a question about that do we retain our previous entries as far as the projection or the previous like our historical enrollment um as far as our our history we have a number of years of history that uh, we use to project how students would be moving through this um through this program so if that's what you're asking about, we have we have all the history in this format. So all our actual data for last probably since 2000, we loaded data, I believe, for about 10 years um, when we started, five to 10 years when we started. So uh, if you're asking about the actual projection scenarios, like this projection scenario, I do save the projection scenarios. And we do we did create a process that can copy a projection scenario that I have right now. Let's say I'm working with this one and I've produced it for the budget. But the government needs a five year projection and but the, the assumptions will pretty much stay almost the same. There might be a few things I need to change, but I still want my adjustments to come along with the scenario. So I can take a, co a, a copy of this scenario complete with adjustments and the process will copy the entire scenario. All our, our, it'll appear in all the cubes. So it'll be an identical copy of the scenario and I can just rename it and give it a different name. So now it's projection 2021 SMA for a strategic mandate agreement, and I can I have a starting point. I don't have to start from scratch. Yeah, so hopefully that, that answers that, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have one more for you, and then uh, for mm -hmm. Jane, who asked, there are three questions, one of which I think you've answered. I'm going to ask one of hers now, and then I'm going to wait till the end for the other one. Uh, so the one that I'm going to ask now is, looks, looks like your model projects also WGUs for grant projections. Does it also project min-max adjustments? Uh, the answer to that is, the answer to that is no, but we do have another cube because we um, tried to do a lot with TM1. We do have another cube that um, actually handles the min-max adjustments for actual data. Yeah. So, so yeah, we don't we do can. projections. Pardon? Yeah, you know, I was just going to say we can. In yours, it's separated out into uh, two different cubes. Mm -hmm. Right, it's separated out into two different cubes, and we don't necessarily project that. 
but the actuals that we're pulling in could potentially have the min-max adjustments already included. And so our projections would either include or not include. Uh, right now, I don't think they include the min-max adjustments, but that's something another analyst can take from the other cubes that we have that track um, min-max adjustments. So we do have um, a cube that does track all the min-max adjustments and we have all that history. So potentially we could build that into the model as well. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Okay, I'll just go through because I we are running. Um, so I'll just go through Great really quickly. So goes. Yeah. Yes, and I, I really appreciate the questions. Those are really good. Um, now the tuition projection cubes are fairly straightforward. I won't spend too much time on them. There's the layout. Um, we just work with um, the previous year's tuition rates and then we use percentages. And I'll show you right here. We can uh, enter a percentage adjustment um, or we can type in a new rate. And usually by the time we're doing for the one year out, we have a fair idea of what the tuition rates would be. So I just typed in a rate. Um, these rates have no bearing on our current rates. I just made them up as I went along there. Uh, the other component that we have uh, is, is service teaching. Now this is um, what happens is uh, normally students take most of their courses in their home faculty. And when students take courses in other faculties, the teaching faculties require the teaching faculty requires compensation for teaching students for whom they do not receive any tuition revenue. So, uh, for example, here, and so we have a separate cube that projects this. So, for example, here, uh, what I'm showing is for 21-22, we've projected that over 3,200 um, engineering students will be taking science courses. And then budgets can make whatever adjustment they make um, in their model for the for that number of students. So we have history here as well. We can provide um, what we do is we provide our faculties with details. So there is transparency and, and et cetera that we can um, we can provide them details so that they know where their charges are coming from or what we're we're projecting and what their actual values are as well. Okay, and then the budget, everything gets tied together in the budget reporting cube and very quickly, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. There are um, not too many, there are very few calculations done in this. That means the views come up very, very quickly. Um, the undergraduate projections are brought in here. The graduate projections are brought in so that all reporting can be done. And I mentioned this in the past. And there are just some few adjustments that are calculated here because then we project enrollment to the government account dates and we project uh, tuition to the end of term. Now, uh, processes have changed, so this may be a little bit closer than it has in the past um, because of um, the financial withdrawal dates and things that have changed uh, with the new system coming online. But we, any final adjustments, any final little tweaks, we, we can put in here. So, but because there are, like I said, because there are a few uh, changes, this data uh, has very, very fast, easy access. And these are the enrollment, uh, these are, sorry, these are the dimensions we're working with and the budget reporting cubes. So all our data can be sliced and diced um, in with all the, the same dimensions. And then another quick look, in a summary look in our budget reporting cube. Again, I've blocked out the tuition. Um, and then we have WG, WGUs, we have FTEs, everything in the, with the same filters. And um, so we have a lot of information there that is readily accessible. The next slide is simply the file that we project, that we provide for our budgets office. And these are 192 data points. This file used to take, um, before, when we were working with the overall projection and we still had to provide by faculty projections, it used to take a day or two and it used to be pretty painful to create this file. 
now I can create this file in under two hours. So that's a significant time savings. It is um, accurate because I know the, the data is in one spot and I can produce some uh, drill downs. If uh, somebody's questioning something, I can produce data and rationale be, behind why certain uh, calculations were, were um, taken. So a bit of a question came in, Barb, sorry, just before you do mm -hmm. the, uh, the summary there. Um, I don't know if you're using predictive uh, analytics at all in your forecasting. But the question is, if so, what model are you using? Regression, ARIMA, or other? No, we aren't using um, predictive analytics. We use historical enrollment patterns. I mean, the best way I can describe it is the historical enrollment patterns to pro project future terms now so we are not using predictive analytics we used like for undergraduates we use transition rates from year one to year two so there are a number of ratios and and um, in our model it's it but we are not using predictive analytics everything is based on history so we do input a lot of knowledge for example during the covid year there were things that changed we have the option of changing how our model treats our prior years in projecting the future. So if we wanted to um, give less importance to the COVID year, then we could do that. So uh, one of the really exciting things coming up, uh, it's already in the product, but it getting better and better every day is the ability to have the tool itself do some of the projecting for you, as well as integrating if you're doing Python or something like that integrating with those types of uh, programs so that we can actually bring in or embed that predictive model in the tool, which is, is cool because then it's also auditable, right? So um, it now labeled planning analytics with Watson is, you know, there's a reason they added that from a, from a marketing standpoint. Um, it's very, very, it's not very new technology, but it's new to be included with planning analytics. So uh, like Barb, a lot of people haven't adopted it just yet, but it's there and it's ready to be used. Thanks, Erica. No, um, that is something. Pardon. Sorry, I was just going to say, uh, Lynn was uh, asking a, a related question. So how would you handle a higher than expectment, expected freshman cohort, which is probably something you guys are all sort of looking at for this coming fall? So we would, uh, we do have another, we created another enrollment model, uh, sorry, another model inside uh, planning analytics, and we project our fall enrollment for undergraduates. Um, we project our fall enrollment during the, the cycle, the, the application cycle. We also have, um, and application information from for a graduate program. So we would handle this with adjustments. And yes, I mean, ideally, uh, I would love to look at something like predictive analytics and uh, combine some of these models where our model is projecting um, a certain number for this fall and to incorporate that number directly into the model for at least a particular scenario. Now we do use other information. That's why we make adjustments at different levels. So that's something to look at for the future for us, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Because this is, this model, what we did was we tried to recreate the same methodology we used to start with. Now the methodology by today's standards may be um, older, but that's what we needed to have um, something concrete to create. Yeah. But for sure that one of the future plans would include this and I would be excited to see what uh, what could be done. Yeah, we can, yeah, definitely. And, and I think a lot of people are going to have, you know, the forecast that's more human intervened and then the predictive as well as, you know, last year, current year, remainder of year. So I could see a situation where instead of budget versus actual, we've got a three or four different scenarios all on the same screen. Um, this right. is probably a good lead into your summary slides though, Barb. Okay, so let me close it off here. And so looking back, I'm not gonna go through the details on this slide. We fell into a lot of the traps 
that are common when uh, implementing new software. Um, and just to talk, highlight, you know, highlight some of the key points of our experience. Now we uh, we did have some lessons learned. We needed a clear understanding of uh, what we were designing and the systems um, we were using. And we did not have that knowledge when we were building the model. We did have, uh, a little bit later, we did have some great training uh, from NewCom. And, uh, and we learned about the structure of dimensions and cubes and, and uh, feeders and reports. There are also, um, there's also uh, documentation provided by IBM as well. So we needed to learn, so we needed to learn that first and then build out the model. Um, planning analytics is a powerful tool, but yes, just like uh, Carrie had mentioned, it, it need, there is some heavy lifting at the outset and uh, regularly really as, as things change. Um, sometimes the uh, changes to our system, for example, our tuition, um, our internal tuition structure for internal, I, I, Sorry, our internal tuition structure for international students is changing as of this year. So that may be a major change to one of our cubes, or it could be maybe creatively done um, without uh, rebuilding the cube. So that's something we have to take a look at. And then some of the challenges, um, just if we, we did use an external consultant to start out with, and uh, we were building this cube as we were designing it, sort of building this model as we were designing it, and we were doing, we wanted to do too much as well. So um, as far as the model, using an external uh, consultant for something that was very complex and specific to the University of Windsor and the way we wanted to do it and the way our model was originally set up, that created some, uh, frustration simply because we didn't take the time to, um, well, one of the reasons was we didn't take the time to sketch out the model or to develop a prototype, maybe in Excel, so that the consultant would understand and be able to uh, produce the model for us fairly quickly. So it did take more time than we, ex we expected. And then we needed staff time that we didn't allocate for um, during the model. We ran two models for a number of years. 2021 was the first time we ran. Um, that brings me to the next slide. The, uh, 2021, the pandemic year, was the first time we ran planning analytics exclusively. And we had submitted the budget um, right before lockdown. And we had to open everything back up and create about eight to 10 scenarios to account for the COVID, the realities because of COVID-19. And without this model, I would have not been able to turn around the data that was requested at different times because this was intense work to get a budget submitted within, I believe, a month or so, a revised budget. And this was incredible. This was like the um the first uh, run of planning analytics in production and um and this was the the case and i was able to to provide a lot of the data as people were sitting in meetings i can send them screenshots i can drill down drill up summarize and produce it with um, actuals in the same uh, breakdown we could do some quick what if analysis and we were happy like the one thing we like of course is works well with excel we live in excel in this office so for the most part so we like that so our next steps and i'm wrapping up here sorry about the extra time um the next steps we want to maintain and revise the model so that has to be a, a scheduled um, event uh, we need to upgrade and schedule the upgrade of the client and the server software and test all that out. So that has to be scheduled as well for this year. Um, we need to streamline our reports and take advantage of some of the new client software and create dashboards and um, have some better looking reports. And then we need to finally just give uh, additional staff um, training and access. We do have some user licenses where we can hand them off to budgets and maybe they can contribute to the projection process or uh, pull off data on their own. And that brings me to the end 
of uh, my presentation. And if there are any other questions, if there's time at all, I'm sorry for running over time. That, no, it's great, Barbara. It was really good content. And I didn't want to cut off the questions because I felt they were important and contextual. So uh, I do apologize to the group that we're running over. There is one more that uh, I did promise that we would address right at the end. So at least it'll be on the recording, um, along with my puppy barking, if you can hear that. Um, the question was, how long did it take to do your start to actual completion of this model? I'm going to preface that with like most organizations, Barb's model has been an evolution more so than a hard stop, hard, hard start. Um, and, and Barb, maybe you can sort of keep me honest here, but uh, the, the long and short of it is it really depends, but maybe you can comment on your personal experience. You're absolutely right, Erica, that it has just been an evolution. We started um, with a consultant and we underestimated the time. So I think it, we started with about 30 hours and um, I don't want to quote exact numbers here, but we, we grossly underestimated the time because we were not prepared. And then we, um, uh, it was the understanding of the model. The model had to be rebuilt. Um, because of the uh, uh, move to UInsight student and that uh, we were fortunate enough to have somebody that had um, a vast experience in um, programming and he was an anal analyst. Um, he was involved in um, creating our homegrown student information system that we used prior to uh, uh, Campus Solutions. So he had in-depth knowledge. Uh, he used our uh, training materials plus IBM workbooks to learn um, came on on his own and it took him probably about ten, uh, three months that uh, he did work just part-time here but he learned it on his own and he was able to update our um, and develop anything that we wanted um, so we have a number of things in planning analytics in addition to this model including actual data so at different points in time it is uh, it is a lot of work but the work pays off, as I saw in the pandemic year in, in last year, it pays off um, completely because at the time where somebody's looking for data immediately and it has to be accurate, I have that data for them. And I can explain an audit and um, let them know exactly how their projections were calculated and the rationale behind them. Yeah, and I mean, even that one report that you were commenting to me earlier, having a 75% time savings to generate those reports is not insignificant. And the accuracy, I remember you saying, was was quite a bit improved as well. So we, we look at the upfront time, but then over time, it sort of pays off uh, fairly quickly. Yeah, we definitely Excellent. have better data. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Barb, I can't thank you enough. Your presentation was fantastic. The questions were fantastic. Uh, yes, this session is going to be sent to you. A link will be sent to everyone. Uh, it'll be a, a private G Drive link. So you're welcome to share that with your colleagues, um, as well as the slides. They will be shared. And uh, I think that's it. I you think I'm remembering everything. That might be a new day. Uh, so with that, I'm going to wish you all a very happy afternoon. But thank you so much for the extra time. We super appreciate it. The content was over the top today. Really, really happy. Uh, yeah, everybody is very, very, I'm getting some very positive feedback here, Barb. So uh, do have a great day and we will chat with you soon. We'll see you on the next webinar. Bye for now.